The truth lies in bedtime stories from See Through News. Series 4 The Quiet Revolutionary The heroic role played in a plot to assassinate the king by someone you've all heard of. By Sternwriter. Episode 2 The Cauldron. <laughs> At the time of our story, James Parkinson is 39 years old. James qualified as a surgeon a few years back and is now establishing himself as a physician. He's taken over the family business from his apothecary surgeon father, John. James works and lives with his young family at number 1 Hoxton Square, London. In 1794... Hoxton is one of London's more fashionable addresses. But London is changing and changing fast. Britain's industrial revolution and imperial expansion are in full swing, and its capital city is full to the brim of incomers seeking a living, a fortune, or asylum. The surgery at number one Hoxton Square is busy. On its patient list, the well-to-do are being joined by the hand-to-mouth, poor weavers, carpenters, theatrical lowlife. The fine, high-ceilinged rooms of Hoxton's handsome townhouses are occupied by landowners, merchants and professionals whose horizons are ever-expanding. In the gaps and spaces around them, Hoxton's attics Basements, courtyards and alleys are filling up with those whose vision extends no further than their next meal. Let's dodge an oncoming handcart piled high with chair legs. Let's sidestep that grimy-faced child bearing a basket of spindles. Let's pause at number one Hoxton Square, skip up the stairs, slip through the front door and peek into the physician's waiting room. There, in the upholstered armchairs, are the fine ladies and gentlemen of Hoxton. They hold perfumed silk kerchiefs to their noses. On the wooden benches at the other end of the room are labourers and skivvies, pungent with labour. The surgery door opens. We catch a glimpse of our hero. Now, historians, I discovered from Dad's Trove, have only turned up one physical description of James Parkinson. All we have to imagine James's appearance is this, written by a geologist colleague of his 26 years after James died. <clears throat> Mr. Parkinson, it reads, was rather below middle stature, with an energetic intellect and pleasing expression of countenance, and of mild and courteous manners, readily imparting information, either on his favourite science or on professional subjects. So, it seems that in later life, James was, to his geologist chums at least, modest and mild-mannered. But our fossil-hunting biographer didn't know James Parkinson at the time of this story. Age 39, James is passionate about politics. It's 1794, five years after the French Revolution. He's hardly alone in this, but James's interest is more than passive. Devoted though he is to his patients, James also devotes all his spare time to writing pamphlets which urge reform in order to avoid revolution. James's pamphlets are shared with like-minded professionals as they correspond up and down Britain. One of James's close friends is John Smith, bookseller of Lincoln's Inn Fields. Now, in 1794, bookselling is booming and John Smith is thriving. Every day, more people learn to read. Everyone's hungry for knowledge. One by one, old truths are being exposed as ignorance, fakes, and lies. 
They're calling this the Age of Reason for a reason. But in 1794, bookselling is also a sensitive business. Whether they contain truth or lies, books hold knowledge, and knowledge is power. The powerful want to be the ones who determine which news is true and which is fake. The powerful don't trust the swinish multitude to decide for themselves. Only when their fear exceeds their greed do the powerful relinquish any power. In 1794, bookselling is a dangerous business. Every few days, John Smith tells his friend James about another printer or publisher who's been arrested for sedition or treason. They all protest they're only advocating reform in order to avoid bloodshed, but they all end up in the courts, in prison, and, more often of late, even swinging from the gibbet. James, John, and their circle of reformer friends wonder how long it will be before it will be John Smith's turn to be arrested and have to plead his innocence. Many of England's emerging middle class in possession of an education but no land worry about losing their livelihoods. Bookseller John has good reason to fear losing his life. Times are so strange, John Smith's head is as much at risk from his own government as from any revolutionary. For John Smith, as for his newly literate customers, books are opening eyes, just as the government is shutting mouths permanently. James and John's fellow reformer and good friend, George Higgins, who works at a chemist shop, likes to say that books are both tonic and toxin. A couple of years before our story, bookseller John Smith and chemist shopman George Higgins and a couple of other reformer friends took a risk. They concocted a cure for the affliction, a tincture of words and thoughts they hoped might relieve Britain's malady. They founded the London Corresponding Society. The London Corresponding Society has rapidly become a major node in a nationwide social network of like-minded concerned professionals. These reformers, anxious Britain may be about to follow France into revolution, meet to discuss their dilemma. They usually meet in secret in taverns and coffee shops throughout the land. You might call them chat rooms. These corresponding societies communicate, share, and spread their ideas via the postal service. This new content delivery network is growing at phenomenal pace, boosted by brand new communications technology. In 1794, Robert Stevenson was three decades from demonstrating his rocket locomotive, but the tracks, figuratively at least, were being laid. Canals. Roads, stagecoaches were spreading across Britain like cracks across thin ice. These new communication channels convey not just coal, timber and grain, not just John Smith's books and George Higgins's tinctures, but also James Parkinson's pamphlets and impassioned letters of the London Corresponding Society. Conveying letters has become too complex and important a job to be left to street urchins and servants. There are now specialist postmen. The Royal Mail, founded by Henry VIII, is now getting seriously professional. The year before the events of our story, their rising status and critical role in the Age of Reason has been marked by the provision of uniforms. For the first time, you can spot a postman. Round the kingdom they speed, spreading data in packets, from inn to inn, from tavern to tavern, house to house. This union-wide web is astonishingly rapid and efficient. Its sheer scale makes it impossible for the government to monitor. It also makes it easier for ordinary people to conceal their intentions and their identities. 
Unlike the uniformed postmen, correspondents can conceal themselves in a cloak of anonymity. James was among the first to join the London Corresponding Society, and its core is now formed by these three friends, James the physician, John the bookseller, and George the chemist's shopman. If you're wondering what a chemist's shopman is, that's how the court records that Dad dug up record his occupation. No, I'm not entirely sure what a chemist shopman does either, but George Higgins is a minor character in our story, so let's crack on. London, in 1794, is no place to loiter or lollygag. In 1794, the stench of revolution is gusting across the channel. The capital's coffee shops and taverns, like the Shoreditch Tavern in which we find James, John and George, now they've left their places of business, team with the newly enfranchised middle class. Doctors, lawyers, industrialists, artisans, merchants, they all gather. They're terrified that revolution might snatch away their hard-won status. They're also thrilled that reform might enhance it. They pore over pamphlets, news sheets, newspapers, these correspondents trying to sift hard fact from the gush of rumour, speculation and fake news. They talk and talk, but they talk in low voices. Manservants, wenches and hawkers, illiterate but no less interested, linger, hover, eavesdrop. Among them are spies in the pay of the Prime Minister's increasingly paranoid Attorney General, John Scott. John Scott has instructed them to keep an ear out for Britain's would-be Dantons, Marats and Robespierres. The Attorney General's snitches get bonuses for successful arrests and convictions. These whispered conversations and private letters sometimes end up in print. Anyone who can hold a quill seems to be writing a pamphlet on the political situation. Some wave the flag and say the Attorney General's iron fist is insufficiently ferrous. They tend to publish under their own names. Most, however, urge reform. Many of them, fearing reprisal from the unbending Attorney General, protect themselves with pseudonyms. You can feel England bracing itself. But for what? Revolution? Repression? Reform? No one knows, but everyone wants to know. Nine years before the events of our story, a London insurance agent was bankrupted by a Jamaican hurricane he decided it was time to look for a steadier line of business. He started a newspaper, giving it the modest title of the Daily Universal Register. The quality of its continental coverage, particularly the astonishing events in Paris, soon gained the Daily Universal Register a reputation as one of the more reliable of the mushrooming array of news sheets. Six years before our story, the Universal Register rebranded itself as The Times. Simpler, more eloquent, much more gravitas. But in this crowded Shoreditch tavern, the three wigged heads we now see huddled together are not concerned about The Times' masthead. Amid the tavern's hubbub and bustle, they're poring over the tight, dense columns below it and the news these columns contain from across the channel. Let's imagine ourselves to be one of those serving winches or pint-pot boys. Are we in the pay of the Attorney General, or are we just curious about what these three men are murmuring? I'll leave that up to you, but either way, we have to get close. It's hard to hear what Physician James, Bookseller John and chemist's shopman George are saying. In episode three, The Pint Pot Paperweights, we see how much of their conversation we can pick up.
The series was written, narrated and produced by Sternwriter. Audio production by Samuel Wynn. The Truth Lies in Bedtime Stories is a see-through news production. See-through news is a not-for-profit social media network with the goal of speeding up carbon drawdown by helping the inactive become active. For more, visit seethroughnews.org. Thank you for listening.